Committee, I'd like to welcome you to the 1990 Institute on World Affairs. This year we're focusing on Eastern Europe and the world in transition. As many of you know, the Institute has a 25-year-old history of presenting wide-ranging discussions by scholars, activists, and public officials on topics of international interest with funding provided by the government and the student body, and this year in cooperation with the Stanley Foundation. I would like to take this opportunity to invite any students who may be interested to help us choose the topic for next year's institute after this week is over. Um, you can look in the daily for announcements of meeting times when our committee will be forming and meeting. I'm uh, uh, unhappy to report that tonight that Petra Kelly had to cancel at the last minute. Um, President Gorbachev of the Soviet Union uh, scheduled a last minute visit to Germany and as a member of parliament she was obliged to stay there and meet with him. But I'm happy that Diana Johnstone has agreed to take her place tonight. Um, and before Julie introduces Diana, I would like to say a little bit about tomorrow's events. Diana was originally only going to speak at 12 o'clock in the Pioneer Room tomorrow, and she'll also be doing that. And the title of her talk tomorrow will be The New Europe, Politics and New Social Movements. And tomorrow evening, also in the Pioneer Room, Gail Lapidus will be speaking on the rise of nationalism and ethnic conflicts. Also tonight, you're all welcome to join us for a reception after the talk, and it'll be in the social room of the University Towers right across the street. So I'll hand things over to Julie Bradley, who will announce tonight's speaker. Diana Johnstone received a doctorate in French literature from the University of Minnesota, where she was active in the campus movement against the war in Indochina. Later, she organized the first contacts between American citizens and Vietnamese representatives in Paris. Ms. Johnstone is the author of The Politics of Euromissiles, Europe's Role in America's World, and has been the European editor of In These Times since 1979. Presently, she has taken a leave of absence and is serving as the press attaché for the Greens in the European Parliament. Diana? I'm happy to be here and a little bit uh, frightened, too, because Petra Kelly, whom I've known for a number of years, is a hard act to follow and an impossible act to replace. Um, but I have taken up her title of German reunification and a green view of Europe, so I will speak to the same subject that she was planning to speak to, but, of course, inevitably, in my own way and not in her way, although I think there must be very significant overlappings between what she would have said and what I would say, inasmuch as she is a Green member of the Bundestag and I'm currently the press attaché for the Greens um, in the elected from several countries in the, to the European Parliament. To start out on uh, German unification, I notice in the, in the program it's reunification, but it's usually called unification to emphasize that this is not the bad old Germany that's being put back together. Uh, so far, I don't know how much uh, you're aware of it, but the people in Europe who are the most worried by German unification are the Germans. And among the Germans, the most critical have been the Greens. There are a number of reasons for this worry and this critical attitude, but the most important can be summed up in the word process. A year ago, popular demonstrations in Leipzig and other East German cities were building up to the climax of November 9 when the Berlin Wall opened. 
This was the end of the division of Berlin, of Germany, and of Europe, and was also the end of the whole post-war superpower condominium that kept Europe separated into two hostile military blocks under the pretense that each was a military threat to the other. In short, an end to the Cold War. Those demonstrations were led by some of the same people who had been active in East Germany's peace movement. They were intellectuals, critical of the oppressive Hanukkah regime, who mostly hoped for a democratic East German socialism uh, that would be renewed and changed through grassroots democracy. A number of these people had been actively supported by such West German Greens as Petra Kelly. Now, Greens are an extremely diverse bunch, and it would be wrong to suggest that all German Greens had the same attitude toward the rapid developments in East Germany. But it's not too far wrong to say that most Greens would have supported enthusiastically a process of grassroots revolution, such as the activists who first braved the Hanukkah regime seem to be calling for. A leading, member, a leading Green member of the Bundestag, Antje Falmer, was among those who welcomed what they called the first democratic revolution on German soil. Many in West Germany hoped that this revolution would go on to create an East Germany that could combine democracy and social concern in ways that would make an original contribution to the political culture of the German-speaking world. Unification could be farther down the road, part of a process of abolition of boundaries in Central Europe. In fact, the intellectuals who led the East German Revolution were soon disillusioned. In retrospect, it was perhaps not so much the people who overthrew the Hanukkah regime as Gorbachev. The Soviet leadership around Gorbachev had apparently decided thanks in large part to the German peace movement, that a united Germany would not be a threat to the Soviet Union, and that giving up the Soviet Union's East Ger European buffer zone was a price worth paying for access to West German technology and know-how. Without Soviet support, the Hanukkah regime fell like an overripe fruit. The process of revolution from below was soon overtaken by the takeover from above, Chancellor Helmut Kohl pushed successfully for a rapid Anschluss. That is, instead of negotiating the merger between two very different German states with participation of the grassroots, those two German states whose legal systems, property rights, and social systems had evolved in divergent ways for over 40 years, the West German system simply took over East Germany. A green criticism of this process is that the East German people were robbed of their revolution. This is true, but it is also true that the majority of the people, contrary to the expectations of the intellectuals, were apparently far less interested in making their own revolution than in buying Western consumer goods. They are paying a high price for this preference. The monetary union on July 1st gave East Germans some hard currency spending money, but the conversion of East Germany to the Deutsche Mark is having devastating effects on the East German economy. As Jacques Delors, the president of the Executive Commission of the European Community, observed recently, East German yogurt is just as good as West German yogurt. But East German consumers were hungry for the sophisticated West German packaging. Moreover, East Germany's centralized social economy proved especially vulnerable to takeovers by West German monopolies and big concerns. The big German, West German chains bought up East German state stores, sometimes by deals that would have been illegal according to West German anti-cartel laws. But in East Germany, during the transition period, there has been virtually no law at all. The chain retail outlets canceled orders for East German goods in anticipation of the monetary union when East Germans would have Deutschmark to spend. In fact, the West German producers were not geared to supply 16 million more consumers in East Germany, and after the monetary union, 
East German shoppers had to stand in line for food for the first time. Prices soared in a completely arbitrary manner, sometimes twice as high in one town as in the next. The money in any case was being spent by East German consumers for West German goods, thus indirectly undermining their own jobs. As, the, as their domestic market collapses, East German producers are going out of business. Their foreign market has collapsed too. East Germany used to be a main supplier to the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and other East Bloc countries. But since its goods are priced in DMARCs, Eastern countries can no longer afford them. Unemployment is soaring in East Germany. The people hardest hit are East German women, whose employment rate was perhaps the highest in the world, about 93%. German women had access to excellent child care facilities as well as housing. As government subsidies are withdrawn, these advantages are being lost. The Greens, the independent women's movement, and the various citizens' movements who were active last year in opposing the moribund Hanukkah regime have banded together to present joint lists of candidates in East Germany in the first all-German elections on December 2. They will be campaigning for the grassroots democracy that has been plowed under in Kohl's accelerated unification from above. Energy policy is a field where Greens especially deplore the rapid Anschluss. Industrial development in the communist bloc states was notoriously energy wasteful and polluting, especially in East Germany, where brown coal deposits are abundant and abundantly polluting. West Germany has developed filters as well as other energy-saving technologies that could have been quickly and cheaply applied in East Germany. Experience shows that smaller, uh, locally-based power companies are best suited to apply energy-saving technologies that combine heat and light production. Green saw an opportunity for East Germany to serve as a showcase experiment in conversion to locally run economical and ecological energy use. Instead, the trustee organization that is selling off the state property of the former German Democratic Republic signed a contract, the Stromvertrag, with the three main West German power monopolies that, in, that instead of an ecological conversion in West Germany, will simply use East Germany as an expanded market for the West German firms. And through the West German power companies, East Germany will be getting nuclear electricity from Europe's nuclear powerhouse, France. Now, there are other things uh, also in the, in, that are going on with this that are quite contrary to green conceptions of locally-based development. And... Uh, if the Greens have been the only political party that has dared object strongly to this Anschluss, there's much more grumbling among Germans about unification than may be imagined from a distance. The West Germans tend to regard the Ossis as down at the heel cousins who want everything without knowing how to work for it. There's fear of the pressure on the labor and housing markets from East Germans and also from other East Europeans transiting through East Germany on their way to West Germany. East Germans, many say that they are feel as if their country has been defeated and occupied for a second time. Nevertheless, they're passive, apparently hoping that defeat and occupation will somehow give them a chance at the economic miracle that they missed when it was experienced by West Germany in the 1950s. No one knows what political form this passivity may take if the economic miracle fails to follow. For Greens, German unification has so far been a mixed blessing. Of course, the good news is of the end of the Cold War, the end of fear of nuclear war in Europe, the new freedom of travel and expression, the democratic elections and political liberties. These are goals that Greens have pursued since their movement emerged a decade ago. And it can be said that Greens have already made their contribution to these crucial changes. However, the next step is to use these new freedoms to build a truly new Europe. 
The coal method of unification has not set a good example. One problem is the arrogance of the winners of the Cold War. The Soviet system of communism has collapsed. The leading exponents of the Western capitalist system are, predictably, claiming victory. However, the collapse of the East might well be the harbinger of a slower decline of the Western system insofar as Eastern communism was essentially a forced industrialization that took Western industrialization as its model. The environmental disaster in Eastern Europe is a warning that a drastically new model of ecological, ecologically sustainable economic activity must be developed for Europe and for the world. At the end of October, Greens from all over Europe were in bond for a meeting of the Green European Coordination, which is the umbrella, the very loose umbrella organization of the Green parties of the different European countries. The occasion for the meeting was to draw up a Green position on the November 18 Helsinki II meeting in Paris of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, CSCE. A sharp division emerged at that meeting on the issue of the European community. The 12 nation EC is supported as a potential core of a unified Europe by the Italians, some French, and Belgian Greens. However, the majority of Green parties supported the resolution sponsored by the German and Swedish Greens, which were sharply critical of the EC. The Green Movement is the only movement built on awareness that the uh, policy of unlimited economic growth pursued by both the capitalist West and the communist East cannot be sustained. However, the EC, and in particular the single market scheduled for the end of 1992, is designed to favor unlimited economic growth. Greens favor a Europe of regions, and a paper submitted by the Swedish Green Party stressed that a Europe of regions is not compatible with the EC model. The Swedish Greens pointed out that the main driving force beyond, behind the present cooperation and unification ideas in Europe has been the economic cooperation and multinational growth of big business. Greens are concerned primarily with other democratic needs. The Swedes emphasize that when a problem cannot be solved on the local level, competence should be delegated up to the state level, from there to the national level and beyond, and so on. But there should be no construction of a supranational national authority such as the EC. The Swedish Greens said they agreed with Václav Havel that the days of national boundaries will soon be over, but added that the kind of cooperation Greens envisage will never come into being if countries are coerced from imperium to imperium without having the chance to pass through a stage of sovereignty. Hungarian and Estonian Greens at the Bonn co conference hardly endorsed these words. The Swedes pointed to the Nordic Council of the five Nordic states as a better model of international cooperation. Without any supranational Authority, the Nordic Council has achieved a common passport area, common labor market, and common education rights. The Nordic Council is what the Swedes call a flat structure of cooperation, in contrast to the EC, which is a pyramid with a supranational authority on top. The argument over institutions is becoming the main controversy among Greens in Europe. It is related to problems of security and disarmament. The European Federalists who want a United States of Europe emerging from the EC tend to favor its transformation into a third military bloc between the United States and the Soviet Union. The advocates of a European nuclear superpower are unclear when it comes to military relations with the United States. They tend to be supportive of US policy while arguing that Europe needs its own independent foreign and military policy in order to play a role independent of the United States. This contempt some Europeans who are critical of US military involvement in the Gulf and elsewhere. 
However, a European superpower would in fact have the following choices, either import U.S. arms technology and thus become a supportive market for the U.S. military industrial complex, or else invest billions to build up a mil European military industrial complex able to compete. This would in fact mean following the U.S. example of military spending, which most Europeans see as a failure. Another consideration is that a European military industrial complex would probably be even harder to keep under democratic control than the American one. The advocates of EC as military superpower are, tend to be unfriendly to the Helsinki II CSCE project, which is in fact a disarmament process rather than an alternative military structure. The fact that both the United States and the Soviet Union are members of the CSCE raises objections among the champions of an independent European nuclear superpower centered on the EC. The German-sponsored resolution passed at the Bonn Green meeting warned that the virtual collapse of the Warsaw Pact is beginning to be used by various Western governments, particularly France, to transform the EC into a third military bloc between the USA and the USSR. It also warned against the continued existence of NATO as the basis for aggression against southern countries and the building of national armies within the existing borders of the Soviet Union where ethnic conflicts are growing more and more serious. The Green Resolution called on the CSCE Special Conference to agree on a new all-European system of collective security, replacing both NATO and the Warsaw Treaty Organization. The collective security system should include dissolution of military alliances, including the Western European Union, no kind of international military integration whatsoever, a ban on nuclear tests and on all nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons in Europe, drastic cuts in conventional weaponry and troop strength, establishment of a permanent CSCE Security Council as a peaceful, conflict-solving mechanism in accordance with the United Nations, a ban on exports of arms and military technology, guarantees for the right to conscientious objection, the Green Resolution specifically rejected any attempts to create an all-European security system excluding the Soviet Union as attempts to create an extended Euro-NATO. The Greens stressed that the end of the Cold War offers an opportunity to deal with the real problems facing humanity and the Earth today. There are no enemies in Europe, they said. Instead, all of humanity is threatened by the ecological crisis. The Greens called for a CSCE Charter of the Environment legally binding states to guarantee clean water, air, and soil. They propose a European Ecological Fund financed by reductions in military budgets to clean up ecological devastation. Besides that, Europe must reduce consumption of fossil fuels responsible for carbon dioxide emissions while phasing out nuclear energy. The green vision is by no means solely European. The need for drastically different policies toward the third world is a central factor in green policy. I would say that the three main principles of uh, green policy, governing green policy regarding the third world are first, rejection of military intervention, second, regional development centered on the needs of the local populations, that is to say, production geared first to domestic or local markets rather than the world market, and third, that the rich countries themselves must shift to a model of, de of sustainable development that could reasonably be followed all over the world. The recent Bonn resolution notes the coincidence of 1992 the deadline for the EC single market coincides with the 500th anniversary of European colonization of the Americas.
Currently, the battle for the oil of Arabia is reviving interventionist strategies of the industrialized nations against the third world, the resolution observed, stressing that southern nations must get a fair price for their raw materials, and Europe, like the United States and Japan, must reduce oil consumption. The Greens did not wait for the invasion of Kuwait to condemn Saddam Hussein for invading Iran in 1980 or massively using chemical weapons first against Iranian soldiers and then against Kurdish civilians in Iraq itself. They condemn Iraq's annexation of Kuwait and support an embargo against Iraq rather than military intervention. Hereby I've done my best to summarize what might be called the official green view of Europe. It has many shadings and the rapidity of change in Europe doesn't make it any easier to define new green politics for so many countries with such different histories, political cultures, and expectations. Finally, I would say that the green vision can never be limited to Europe. The Greens have to be a global movement with a global vision, and Greens in America will also contribute to that global vision of a sustainable economic development that can keep a human planet alive. So that's the end of my uh, beginning. Now, I hope things can get a little bit more uh, lively with some questions. parties that mean to be an expression of movements. So the question, is it a party or a movement, is, is a little bit tricky because the, the Greens were formed first in Germany and in Belgium, but Germany is really the, about 10 years ago, uh, as an expression of what are called the new movements, the women's movement, the peace movement, but especially, of course, the environmental movement. Also, I might say the radical democratic movement, the civil rights movements, uh, movements for human rights, and so on. Uh, the, however, the Greens are political parties in this sense, and uh, they, in the last 10 years, they've been elected to national parliaments, first in West Germany, and in Belgium, also to local, municipal, and state governments in, uh, or, or legislatures and to some governments in West Germany. The idea has spread and there are green parties now in most European countries. They've been elected recently in Sweden, in the European Parliament they were elected last year from France for the first time. The Green Party's got 15% of the vote in England in the European elections last year, but because of Britain's electoral law, no, no Greens took seats in the Parliament. Because the success of the Green Parties in Europe has depended on the fact that the electoral system is proportional. And in, in West Germany, to, be, to have seats in the Bundestag, you need 5% of the vote or more. And once the 5% hurdle is crossed, you can have representatives. So this enables new movements and new parties to, to have political expression. Now this in the Anglo-Saxon system is not possible. And so that relates to your second question of there are Greens in the United States. There certainly are. And there may be just as many Greens and just as much of a Green movement in the United States as anywhere else, perhaps more, but the electoral system does not allow small parties to, to have political voice as they can in Europe. Uh, 
Yeah. There are two for, there are two or even three forms of or perhaps more forms of uh, cooperation. The the uh, position that I just gave you this evening is the position of the green coordination, which is a loose meeting of, of green parties in Europe to get together every now and then and, and try to hammer out a joint policy. And this was an expression of that joint policy. Um, it was, in fact, however, the, uh, the majority supported the policy that was presented by the Germans and the Swedish Greens. Um, there are others who don't agree with that, but that's the majority position. Then, then, there is, uh, then there are various meetings of green legislators that get together. And then there's the organization that I'm working for, which is the European Parliament which is the 12 nations of the European community, which has a parliament with very little power. It's a sort of echo chamber, which is, was uh, given a little bit of, it was uh, given a little bit of more power or influence as a measure to popularize the EC single market throughout Europe. Because, in, because, because uh, the, um, the EC is planning to finally create the common market, only now they call it the single market, by the end of 1992. And this is a project that was essentially designed by the, the Europe-based multinational corporations who want to have a strong, unified, local market so that they will be stronger for worldwide competition um, against American and Japanese firms. This essentially business project, to give it some more popular resonance, the, uh, the parliament has been given an enhanced role. And it, in 1979, the first direct elections were held for the European parliament. And in 19... 84 Greens were elected to the European Parliament, and last year a larger number of Greens were elected. And I'm currently working as press spokesperson for the Greens of the various countries in the European Parliament, and I must confess, after six months, that they are cooperating, but not entirely. Uh, that there are quite a few cultural and political differences uh, bet between them, and especially on the issue of the European community itself. That is the main div divisive issue, as to what attitude to take toward the EC. And that's where the differences are the strongest. And generally speaking, the Northerners are more critical of the EC than the Southerners. I would say this, the extreme cases are Denmark and Italy, so much so there is a Danish anti-EC party that elects members to the EC European Parliament. And uh, in the previous parliament, the Danish anti-EC party was part of the same group with the Greens, with the German Greens. But the Italians refused to be in this group with anti-EC party. So the Danes are in a regional grouping. And the Germans and Italians are fighting it out in the Green Group as to what attitude to take toward the EC, because the Italians generally have the attitude that the Italian government is not good for much, and a European government is bound to be better. And uh, so they would like to, to get together with the idea that things will be much better. And that's the attitude also generally of the Spanish and the Portuguese, is that their standards will be raised by being in Europe, whereas the Danes and other Northern Europeans think that it's pretty good the way it is now and that being part of Europe is going to dilute it and make it worse. And um, also, one of the anti-EC women that I know, I have a neighbor who is one of the anti-EC Danes, who said, in Denmark, we've always had a great civil, civic sense. And, uh, and now people are losing that because they say, oh, it doesn't matter what we do because it's all decided in Brussels at the European level. And that there's a feeling that this is bad for 
local democracy. So this is an argument that's going on that is pretty much of a north-south argument. Uh, well, th there is a quite a considerable difference because uh, Margaret Thatcher has opposed, has a, a favored all of the e of the measures that facilitate things for business or finance capital, and uh, the only thing is that she she wants it, the EC as a free market and wants to reject anything that would be social legislation that, for instance, would uh, be set social standards. Um, and there is where she is in conflict with Jacques Delors, who is the, the head of the commission. Now, the Greens do not object to, so, to setting social standards if they set them up. They just don't want to set them down. Uh, <laughs> So there is there there is really quite a difference and well either the fundi realo uh, realo split i I have a rather skeptical view of that. For, for one thing, uh, the terms fundi realo were, were coined by the self-styled realos uh, against their adversaries whom they brand as fundamentalists. Um, and that has pretty much, um, that is really, been bypassed by other events that, that uh, in any movement like the Greens, there's always an inherent problem about, you know, about compromise. How much do you want to be an opposition uh, that will bring up new issues and how much do you want to get into government and, uh, and do something? And can you do something if you get into government? It's, a, it's an ongoing uh, uh, argument that really um, there's no answer to that and it ends up being pretty much a, a matter of experiment. Uh, in Germany, for instance, going into the government has really depended on the circumstances and it ends up depending on the circumstances whether the SPD wants a coalition, on what terms they want a coalition and so on. And a lot of, um, of the argument between the idealists and the realists or so on is a little bit built, is a little bit um, simplified in the media. But there are a lot of real you know, differences on issues that, that go on and on. And the German Greens are a very, very quarrelsome lot. I mean, the, uh, they're arguing all the time. And it's always an amazing thing that the party never splits. <laughs> it hasn't so far. Uh, Petro Kelly was a founder of, uh, among a prominent founder of the of the uh, of the German Green Party, and uh, played a very very leading role in the in the peace movement in particular, in the movement against the missiles. And she has been in the Bundestag since the Greens first got into the Bundestag in 1983. In recent years, she's much more active outside Germany than inside Germany. Um, for one thing, she's bilingual because she was raised in the United States and went to school at American University. And so she speaks a great deal in the English-speaking world. Um, she is not so active in Germany as she used to be. If, I don't know if that answers your question. As to her, her she, she um, 
she's a little bit considered in the idealist wing of the, of the party, but uh, uh, it, for, from that point of view. But again, it's necessary to, to have that um, idealism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, because the Italians and the Germans couldn't agree on anything. <laughs> uh, since they had to elect someone to the post by two-thirds majority, and uh, the Italians back blocked the Germans' candidates, and the Germans blocked the Italians' candidates. And um, I don't think I actually ever did get the Italian vote, but I got the French vote. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When we came in here this evening, we were all informed about a rally on Friday on campus that was talking about withdrawing our soldiers from the Gulf. And the position you gave to the Greens was the same, not to have soldiers there at all, but withdraw the military presence. Uh, we're being prepared by our government for an invasion at the moment. Uh, can you compare those positions? Why, why are the Greens not wanting soldiers there in the first place? Well, uh, it, this is a, one of the basic principles of the Greens, is that they consider that uh, problems are not really solved by military means, and that other, other, other methods must be used. They would, as the statement I quoted said, they would favor an embargo, or they will favor an embargo then backed by negotiations and so on, but they simply don't believe that military means solve problems, on, that they, in fact, will create new ones that nobody's thought of yet. Um, and particularly, this uh, getting into a, to a war in the Middle East, a Western war against Arabs, the consequences of that are absolutely unforeseeable, incalculable, extraordinarily dangerous, and uh, I, I think most people would, would, would consider that that's the case. Actually, the Greens are primarily concerned about stopping European involvement. I mean, stopping American involvement is really the Americans' job. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, it's a very curious thing. I've talked to quite a number of, of uh, East German women, and, and they are the people, they're really depressed about what's going on and fearful for, for the future. At the same time, with the women as with others, there's a sort of passivity that is uh, so far about what's going on. It, it, it's, a, it's a little expressed by this idea that that um, we've lost a war and we're being occupied. There's a, there's a, there's a feeling that there's nothing that, c that, that they can do right now, uh, so that they're hoping things will get better. Um, the, uh, there is a, an independent women's uh, movement which ran candidates with the, with the Greens, but they're w on a very good feminist program. There were early, there were elections last March. They will be running again with the Greens uh, and other citizens' movements December 2nd. But that women's movement, I guess their naivete is shown by the fact that they ran with the Greens in a number of districts. And after the election was over, it turned out that the women had second place on all the ballots so that everywhere that someone was elected, it was a Green and not one of the women. Uh, and I thought that was pretty shocking and, and asked some of the Greens you know, that they ought to have resigned and let the women in some of the positions because they had put them in the second place everywhere. Uh, the women had accepted that and